YouTube clip of what Sailor Moon would have been. I don't know if anybody's seen this. That it would have been more like um, Sweet Valley High or one of those types of books had they have not gone with the original. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it just made me think of it. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, had a little. I was around when they did Sweet Valley High. That was an interesting show. <laughs> um, well, did did you have any sort of uh, uh, what would you say artistically, creatively? Uh, would you use the influence you tend to draw more to sort of refresh the creative juices? Because sometimes you've got to, you know pass things together with the producers, with the directors, with the artists. Is there something as there like a ritual you go through? You go, you sit. You know, you know. No, I'm not a real ritual guy. No. Um, I try to take each project on for what it is because uh, I, I I really think. Um, um, if how would I put this, if it was all my vision, I'm not sure if I would be successful. Because I mean, things that I do, some people like, some people don't. Some things I do are good, and some things I do aren't so good. So I try to approach each project for what it is on its own face value. Um, in terms of creative juices, because I do write for a living also, um, I read a lot, and I read a lot of sci-fi. I like social sci-fi. My favorite series is Ender's Game. All the Ender's Game books and all in Shadow. I, I've read them all. There's a new one out, Ender in Exile. I just finished it. It's excellent. <laughs> so that's what I do to kind of read you. Because I, I find fascination in that. And um, and um, and I get inspired by that. And Have you so, ever read any of Neil Stevenson's social sci-fi? I haven't. But I, now that you've told me, I'll look it up. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he was very influenced, oddly enough, by you know, a lot of the Power Rangers, Sentai, and all the Americanized uh, you know, Japanese stuff. Uh, the, uh, the main character's hero protagonist, and he actually makes a nod to a bunch of the Saban stuff. So yeah. that would be oh, that's interesting nice. that you're both reading each other's thing. Too. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that would yeah. be fun. I'm going to look that up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, we all have to look. There's, there's an old adage that there's only seven stories in the world, and they're all variations on those seven stories. And so uh, we all have to take influence from each other, and we all build on each other. And, um, and sometimes that seems like plagiarism, but it really isn't. It's really kind of a, a, a natural evolution of, of the creative, whatever that creative thing is that we do. So. Well, is there a piece that you're proudest of? Um, yeah, there's an anime. Um, there's a lot of them. I, I, I try. I, I fall in love with every show I do, <laughs> uh, particularly as a director, because uh, you have to love the characters and the story to direct the story. And, and, and the ones that I didn't love didn't come out so good. But uh, I think out of all of the things that I've done in recent years, uh, I'm uh, uh, anime directing. The thing I'm most proud of is uh, there's two shows. Um, the Flag. It's a little-known anime. It's 13 episodes. It's a it's a geopolitical drama about a uh, about a uh, a girl who's a girl journalist who's embedded in a UN unit that's trying to quell a revolution in Tibet, and it's all told from the point of view of her camera. So everything you see is her news camera. So the only time you see her is when she puts the camera down and walks in front of it to do stuff. And it's told from, from her camera's perspective and her friend, who's another journalist who's not embedded from his perspective. He's telling the other side of the story and he narrates it. And it's a wonderful piece. Um, it's got a lot of allegories to what's going on today. Um, the, the cast they gave me was extraordinary. And they did a wonderful job. It's very naturalistic, very cinematic, and it's, and it's wonderful. And the other piece, and only because it's... It just it captured me the same way it seems to have captured the audience, and that's Skurin Lagan. Um, it's it's uh, I mean literally at the in, in the last few episodes when everybody's dying. I hope I'm not spoiling anything. Um, <laughs> when everybody's dying, um, I mean we were literally crying in the studio. I mean we finish and these actors are so good and the dialogue and the story and we're going, okay, let's get another take. <laughs> you know, it's like that. And uh, and I'm really proud of the way it came out. And um, uh, so those are as a director, as a as a performer. Um, Harry and Gungrave. Um, again, I'm not a not a really widely known thing, but he was my first villain, and um, and he's such a complex character who who had a little good in him, but it was overcome by his evil and his mania, and I really got to uh, I really got to act. It really was an acting challenge for me, and um, and at the end when he has this complete personality breakdown on camera, I, I just it was great. I had no voice left. You know, again, we're all weeping, and it's just it's it's really an emotional thing to do some of this stuff, and uh, I think that's why I like it so much. Uh, yes. Creativity back when we had the big Sentai rush of shows like Power Rangers and Weird Troopers back in the game. Do you feel that people have gotten more creative this time go has gone on, or that maybe they're just rehashing all the ideas, like comparatively well, to a lot of what's going on? Well, sometimes rehashing an old idea is a very creative thing to do, um, especially if you improve on it or change it. Um, I don't know. I thought that uh, you know, Power Rangers was, was its own creative, creative endeavor. Uh, 
it was a show I was involved in from the blank page all the way to hit status. And so we really did invent that out of whole cloth. Not only did we have to invent the show, but we had to invent a way to shoot the show and make it. So we had to come up with a whole new way of making a kids' TV show that was not only creative, but cost effective as well. Um, the other shows behind that that we did, The Art Troopers, Mass Rider, Beetleborgs, those were kind of a rehash, uh, trying to capitalize on that. And the idea I think Savan had was that um, everybody's going to try to capitalize. It might as well be us. Um, but now you look at a show like Common Rider, which is out now, um, and they, I think they've taken the, that whole Sentai concept, Americanized Sentai concept, and they've now taken it to the next level. They've really made it more sophisticated. Uh, they brought the acting more realistic. It's less of a cartoon. We were deliberately trying to be a cartoon. They're deliberately trying to be an action show. So I, I think everything builds on the next thing. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see what comes next. <laughs> more questions? Um, have you seen any shows, like, from Japan, like animes that you maybe would like to bring over to America that you'd be like to produce, direct, yes. or act in? Yes. I got the opportunity a couple of years ago to go to Tokyo and uh, to work on a, a documentary that may or may not get finished. Uh, we're still negotiating. And one was on Robotech and one was on Power Rangers. So I got to meet the people who created these shows. And I was introduced to the head of Tatsunoko Productions and the head of Toy who created uh, the people who created all this stuff. And while I was there, I, was at the, I went to the Tokyo Film Festival. And, um, and there was a couple of shows that I saw there that I thought were dynamite, and they're not here yet. And one of them, um, one of them is called Garo, and it's kind of Power Rangers for adults. It's a live action show. It's it it it, it lives on it, it it grows out of the Sentai movement, but it is its own thing, uh, and it's it's very dark and very mysterious. And actually, to bring it to the United States, we'd have to there's a lot of nudity in it, so we'd have to pull back on the nudity a little bit. Um, but it's uh, it's really it's really very cool, and I would love to bring that over. I just don't have a half million dollars in my pocket right now to license it. <laughs> Would that really be your ideal project? I mean, imagine that uh, you could, you know, remake, remix, you know, add your creative input to whatever properties out there, even if it's out on, even if it's Disney owned, whatever. Is there an ideal project that you'd work on? Not really. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know. It's kind of weird because I, I, an ideal project would be one that I created myself, and uh, I'm working on a couple movie scripts, and hopefully those will get made, and they're kind of, they're kind of uh, based in, in. One is a, a kind of a Power Ranger spoof, and the other one is a is a kind of a what would happen otaku saving the world. It's kind of it's kind of what it is. So it's uh, uh, those would be those because I'd like to be able to create something that that gives uh, that does homage to to all of this and uh, treats it with love and respect, yet makes it entertaining and fun for everybody, otaku and non otaku combined. <laughs> Um, well, in the Japanese fan culture, it's mostly about the fan-made items, the doujin, the, you know, kind of everything. Uh, the American fan culture seems to be a whole lot more about um, just getting the stuff in the first place, you know, bringing in whatever is Japanese and you know, changing that, even if it's altering it, you know, like a personalized costume. Um, do you think, uh, with the amount of like collaboration in comics, collaboration in movies, and things that you've been doing, um, it could it would be one culture in ten years? Do you think it'll still stay, you know? Oh God! I hope producer not. and consumer. <laughs> I mean, I hope not. I hope it's not all one culture. <laughs> right. I think that would be boring. Um, right. The uh, it, it is the it is the combination of cultures, the two different points of view coming to the same conclusion that I think makes it special here. Um, it's it, it's special in its own right in Japan, uh, and, and obviously they're the biggest anime fans in the world because it, it comes from their point of view and it's their storytelling style and, and it's and it lives it, it it grows out of their own mythology. Uh, but here we have our own mythology and our own uh, our own basis of where we come from and our own point of view. And I think when you combine those two is when you really get something different and really get something, you know. And, and we're seeing it more and more thanks to Tarantino and those guys, who, you know, with Kill Bill and they're bringing and the Matrix, bringing over that Japanese point of view, but giving an American twist that makes it marketable around the world. And if and if it becomes homogenized, I think we'll lose some of that. So. Um, Hope that answers the question. Yeah. So, what is it that made you decide that wow, anime is cool? What really 